It's free, free for anyone to listen to, to share, to modify, to remix, to make whatever you would like out of it, uh, at least insofar as I am possible, or it is possible to do so. Uh, of course, the live version of this happens on Facebook, but you will be able to later get it on YouTube Mega. And if I'm uh, able to get it onto the I, was it, IPFS uh, file system on the internet, maybe BitChute, I think it's BitChute and hopefully soon on another place uh, that will be mentioned when that happens. This is an alternative to the RAA, the MPA, the IFPI to Netflix, and if you're listening and watching to this, you are hopefully not watching any of that, uh, or listening to any of that. Your mind is not being poisoned with their propaganda, only with my propaganda, mwahaha. Anyway, so as usual, I have some media for you to listen to today. And today I'm going to have a little bit of a special show, uh, in part because I'm not as prepared as perhaps I'd like to be, but in part because there was kind of not even really a suggestion, just a, a hint that I should have more music on this. And in the absence of other feedback, we are going to give you more music. So there will be a couple of music -y things uh, instead of just one, and uh, I will begin that right away. So to start things off, we've got... Uh, let's see what we're we gonna put up first. We'll, we'll like get progressively more musicy as we go. A lot of eight bit stuff today, but we'll start with some negative land. The autonomous Komi Republic, which is part of the Russian Federation, is situated in the far northwest of Europe and spreads up to the, the Arctic, Arctic part of the Ural Mountains. Mountains. It's, it's crossed, crossed by, by nine northern, northern parallels. Ten, Ten fair-sized European states, states could, could be placed on its territory. territory. Besides, Besides indigenous residents, residents uh, that is, the Komi people, there, there are also Russians, Ukrainians, Nenetses, Chuvashis, and Tartars. And now, now let's go back into, into history a little bit. A boy lying on skins behind our backs was, was turning the knobs of a small transistor, transistor radio. radio. And the tent was suddenly filled with an announcer's voice speaking comic. Then the music from Moscow, followed by English and French speech. The recording was made at the Moscow Theater of Musical Miniatures. Now, back to modern times. Your attention, please. At the recommendation of the International Time Bureau, commencing at 23 hours, 15 minutes, 60 seconds, UTC, an extra second will be inserted into the NBS time scale. This adjustment is required to maintain internationally coordinated universal time as broadcast from these stations in close agreement with UT1 or astronomical time. We got so much power now. Do you know how many time zones there are in the Soviet Union? We got so much power now. That's ridiculous. Do you, you, you know how many time zones there are in the Soviet Union? Power and all that. That's power. We got so much power. That's ridiculous. We have 
actually that last one I haven't played before on this particular series. I, I'm starting to get to the point where maybe I should have been keeping track what I've been playing. I'm definitely going to have to make a list to keep me from replaying stuff. Not that replaying some of these things would be the worst thing in the world, but you know, to, to be exposed to new things is good too. So I'm going to try to keep it a little bit fresher. And uh, I'll, I'll be making a list maybe this week or next week uh, so that we can at least know what we can in... Oh, my file failed to load. What the hell? That shouldn't have happened at all. Well, at least the file downloaded, so maybe if I'm really clever, I'll be able to quickly reload this file. There we go. Okay. Crisis averted. Thank goodness for open source and its many, many different ways of doing everything. So that if one way fails, you can quickly do it the other way. I know uh, my friend Infinity, I used to complain all the time about this and how oh, there's like two different desktop environments and three different clipboard managers and 15 different text editors. And if everyone just worked on the same thing, it would work. And we wouldn't have to fool around with all this other stuff. But of course, it in a crisis, when you really need that second thing to be there, it's useful for it to be there. So anyway, uh, the, what we just heard there was Negative Land, Escape from Noise, Time Zones. I think that the song is called Time Zones. Is Does that qualify as music for you? I, I think it qualifies as music for me. But it's certainly kind of like on the, the edge somewhere, right? Like there, there's musical stuff going on. Uh, they're doing They're playing with the... the the, the kinds of things that music plays with. But I guess if you're strictly speaking, looking for music and harmony and melody and stuff like that, it wasn't really there. So I just threw that in with the other two in hopes that uh, that would be enjoyable as well. And then we had Ryan Shello from its NES EP. This quote, this song has a guitar solo, unquote, another 8-bit song. And then Silo Dump, one of my favorites. I'm going to screw the pronunciation of this up, but Jag Min's Inte Lithis Remix. Uh, and that's the one I'm kind of worried that I may have played. I think I've played some Silo Dump before, but I'm not sure if I played that one. I, I don't know their, their songs well enough by heart enough to be able to like match name to the song quite yet. I listen to it a lot on an MP or an MP3 player where I don't really have the option to to learn that. But there is that. So uh, what has been going on in my life this week? Well, right off the bat, uh, yesterday I marched in the Saskatoon Pride Parade. Oh man, I forgot to grab the the little flag. I probably could grab the little flag. That's okay. But I had a little flag. I had like a little bit of beads, and I marched alongside the NDP. Uh, they had like a truck and a couple of banners and. It looked like about 50 people, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. It was kind of hard to tell. There's a lot of people with umbrellas. I was kind of hiding things so that you couldn't really count accurately. Uh, but uh, it was it was an interesting thing. I, I was out there personally because I definitely have had some of my, specifically some of my trans friends, have had a really rough time in the past couple of years where they've been just beat up randomly by people who didn't think that uh, it's acceptable socially in this country to be transsexual or uh, for religious reasons or for whatever reasons. Uh, they're getting really looked down on socially and from the, the perspective of the government and on the legal side. They're, they're going through all kinds of bullshit that I, as a straight white man, do not have to deal with. And so as kind of in solidarity with that, I went out there and actually stood with the flag in the big protest, knowing full well that thanks to C-51, that kind of protest could easily have landed every single participant in a revolving door prison where all of us could be sent to abroad to be tortured. But, of course, this particular protest is in kind of line with the government of the day. So it's unlikely for them to actually do that, but they could. And it's serious and it's important to talk about that because I don't think most of the people at that protest realize that. There was a lot of kids, or at least younger people, younger adults and teenagers out there uh, who were just out having a good time. And that, that's the other thing about that protest is that uh, more than any other protests I've been to, this seemed to be mostly spirit building in practice. It was mostly out, being out, having a good time and proving to the world 
that gay people can have a good time and love one another and there's nothing about it that's that we shouldn't let them do that right it's it, okay and it's worth celebrating and so they wrote they were celebrating everyone was having a good time the crowd was cheering them on everyone seemed to be happy there was no problems no no nazis on the side no uh, hicks with shovels or pitchforks or throwing things at nothing there was enough people not enough solidarity that at least in that moment it was totally acceptable to be in any of the colors in the rainbow and hopefully that kind of thing s continues throughout the year here in saskatchewan where i am now currently at so but of course that it's important to go out and to remind people of this whether or not a parade is the way to do it because there are certainly places, even in Canada, as I mentioned, where you can be targeted just for being gay. People will, will target you just for being a lesbian. People will, will physically attack you for being trans. And it sucks to say it. it. It sucks that we live in the country where this happens, but it does happen here. And it's worth bringing up and addressing when it does in ways that will actually solve that problem at a kind of social level. So, but in the meanwhile, while, while walking around in this pride parade, it was a little bewildering. Like, I, I was an outsider, for sure, like, as the one of the straight guys in the parade. Like, it's, I'm, I'm not there because it's my parade. I'm there in support of another group. But you can still tell they're having a lot of fun. They're, they're, they're in their element. And it was, it was just really weird, uh, on, I guess, from my perspective, to be, to watch it from kind of the outside while watching it on the inside at the same time. It was strange experience on that side but more along the, the side where there's a lot of cheering happening from the crowd and conservatives these days really have grasped onto this concept of virtue signaling uh, and i'm not going to go too deep into that but there, there is something to be said of cheering for something when the, the cost is really low to us and having fun and partying and going to something where you can dance around with half your clothes off in support of this cause but when the actual problems arise, will all of those people be there? Will all of the people who came out in support still be there in support when push comes to shove? That's kind of the question where I'm kind of curious of. Because I've, I've seen it both in person and online enough things that kind of make me question whether they actually would. Is it just a party? Was it just a party? I mean, it was a fun, fun thing to do in the street, I suppose. But is that the end of it? Is that where all progress stops? When it gets to the point where the, the surrounding community and the corporations around it can have something to celebrate and then no further progress happens there? Or are they going to go to the next step? That's kind of the big question. We're thinking about it. anyway. The second thing I wanted to talk about uh, is something I think this hasn't gone all the way through. But the fact that it made its way to a bill is scary enough. And that is the Terrorist Activity Sanction Act in Ontario, one of the Ford government things that they've done where you just have to shake your head and think about uh, what to do about it. Um, this is a well, private member's bill. It made, it, made its way at least through first reading because that's what the copy I have of it. Let's see here. This has four pages, lots of French in here. So if you've been convicted, oh, okay, here we go. So long story short, it rides on top of things like C-51 and the terrorist provisions in the criminal code. And so if you get charged with, for example, sharing terrorist propaganda, i.e. one of those ISIS videos with uh, the heads being chopped off, something like that. So you become charged with some kind of terrorism charge, pretty much however minor, you start losing access to provincial services. And so the one of the things they cut Okay, so you no longer qualify or will not be eligible for a license under the Wildlife Proficient Wildlife Conservation Act, i.e. a fishing license to fish. You're not able to legally fish for yourself to get food. You will no longer qualify for health insurance, so, i.e. the healthcare system is now completely cut off to you. Uh, I suppose you might be able to pay your own way as a Canadian citizen, but you're still basically cut out of having health care. You will no longer have a, be legally able to have a driver's license. So good luck escaping Thunder Bay if you ever move to Thunder Bay because you won't be able to drive out. There's no train out. Uh, they probably won't let you fly because you'll be on a blacklist preventing you from flying. And 
uh, where else are you going to go? Like, I, I guess you could get on a boat. Uh, good luck with that, though. Um, so it, it's basically going to trap people in place who are charged with these bullshit charges. Rent, uh, special needs housing uh, or rent assistance uh, or rent geared to income assistance, you'll be cut off. I, so if you're homeless, you won't be able to apply for to get into uh, housing to get you off the street. You won't be able to get any uh, grants, awards, or loans under for, for school. You won't be able to get any income supplement supports, which whatever. Uh, no Ontario works, uh, so no training to get into the job market. No, basically no welfare. No health ins or work insurance under uh, workplace and safety. So if you get injured at work, you're kind of screwed. They talk a little bit about what to do if it's a child or the, the child's parent becomes convicted. Uh, and I think that's, the rest is just details on that. And the rest is French. Okay, so long, anyway, long story short, this is how it starts. Th this is one way that the healthcare system in Canada can get rolled back because they're first gonna take it away from quote unquote terrorists. And they may even start with actual like, people murdered people. And if they do that, you know, that's one thing. But you have to keep in mind that in this country, when someone is charged with terrorism, that can be merely having the wrong person that you helped out with some minor trivial task. Uh, maybe you help them mail a letter. Maybe you help them fix their computer, something like that. It can be, again, sharing things on social media, whether or not you agree with it, whether or not you're criticizing it, you still may wind up a foul of the law, and boom, now you have no health care, no driver's license, no ability to leave the city you're in legally. And of course, if you try to leave illegally, then they'll arrest you, charge you again, whatever. And so this, this is, a, to me, a scary bill, because one, it doesn't have to stop here. Once they've taken those kinds of rights away from terrorists, they'll probably do it to some other group, maybe child pornographers or organized criminals or people who download music on the internet. If the precedent is there for them to take away healthcare from people who have been merely charged with a crime, they'll do it to more people until they can roll back healthcare province-wide for basically everything, including speeding tickets. That's where that slippery slope leads. Now, of course you could say, well, we're on that slippery slope, but we're not that far down yet. We'll, we'll accept it for terrorists, but not organized criminals or whatever. But we have to be conscious of the, the potential for that, that's one thing that's wrong with this. But the other is, of course, that the, the terrorism law itself is already open-ended and broad enough that they can charge you uh, with shaky evidence, possibly manufactured evidence. You're not allowed to have a lawyer, barely allowed to have a trial, and barely allowed to see the evidence against you. So th this is a, a very short plank to losing your right to healthcare and a driver's license and basically the ability to survive in the province of Ontario. And sure, this is only Ontario right now. Ontario is pretty big, but it's, it's not the end of the world if one province does this. Are other provinces going to follow suit? If the Conservatives win federally, will they bring this sort of thing to the national level? These are kind of things we should be watching for. And I mean, this, this was a factor in le my leaving Ontario because I don't want to be stranded in Ontario. I don't want to be caught up without a license to drive, without access to health care. If I'm going to live in a place with single-payer health, I, I want to at least have the right to access it if I absolutely need it. And this, this, is, this, is, this goes too far. Like we, we shouldn't be talking about removing health care from people unless maybe they're not citizens. There, there's some degree of, of uh, limit of what we can actually do with the, the resources we have as a society that maybe that's an acceptable line to draw. But other than that, like removing the healthcare from people who we don't like or have done something that we don't approve of, it's a way, way too dan dangerous precedent. Way, way too dangerous to, to even go down that road. That, that road should not be open to us. And so that's, that's kind of something we should be uh, keeping our eye on. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about is the new NAFTA. Now, I have not gotten into enough of the details to know what has and hasn't been agreed to on the new NAFTA, in part because it was negotiated in total secrecy uh, and they keep adding stuff to it, I notice. On the TV just yesterday, I think, uh, Trudeau was talking about how they're continually negotiating the trade agreement between Canada and the United States and under the, the framework of NAFTA, or the new NAFTA at least. And my understanding was up until that point that it was a done deal and signed by both sides, although not necessarily ratified. 
And one of the things that was apparently in it was the Trans-Pacific Partnership's old IP, quote-unquote, IP chapter, which was worth resisting enough that there was a huge public protest against it in both the United States and in Canada. And in fact, it was big enough that they removed the chapter from that trade agreement in order to push the rest of it through. But because the new NAFTA was negotiated in secret, they were able to put it in and agree to it before the public was able to form any kind of resistance. Now, what is included in this? Is it the internet blacklists? Is it six strikes laws? Is it uh, internet censorship? All of the above? Again, uh, since I haven't had access to the new NAFTA, I don't know off the top of my head. The fact that we're even talking about this, though, suggests that there's been a failure of leadership in both the United States and in Canada to provide the, the public a way to be informed on what laws are coming down the pipe, what we have agreed to change our laws to do, and why are we even allowing our executives to change the laws like this anyway? Bills should be coming from members of the House of Commons, not from international trade agreements negotiated in secret by special interest groups. This isn't where our laws should be coming from in a democratic system. I mean, on to some level, I guess, the House of Commons is going to have to get this from somewhere and someone in the House of Commons is supposed to, it will take this bill or will take a bill that implements this treaty and change our laws with it. But in practice, this is the new law. This is the law we are going to be living in. It's coming down the pipe and it's going to hit soon. So something to also keep our eye on. Another thing worth mentioning, uh, Google in uh, Google Chrome made some changes to their extension system. Now, this particular computer is running Chrome. It is a Chromebook. Chrome is practically the only thing running on it ever. So there are quite a few Chromebooks. They are Linux based. They're not great because they're not safe uh, in the sense of they're not reproducibly built uh, using free and open source software. But it was what was available when I needed a Linux computer at the time. So I'm still working on kind of replacing it. I think I'm going to be speeding up that process a little bit in the near future. But long story short, there's a lot of people who use Chrome. Uh, it's, I think, one of the biggest, if not the bi biggest web browser in the world right now, having displaced Mozilla Firefox uh, quite a while ago. And what they're changing is the extension system that Adblock and Ublock and Ublock or Ublock Origin, Ghost3, uh, and other ad blocking systems use to block advertisements. And in fact, Google's own inter or documents, or oh, was their SEC 10. Uh, Form 10-K filing, which is uh, required, something that big companies in the states are required to do, They, which was uncovered by, well, it says here in 9to5google.com that it's uncovered by Hill, so that probably means Cash Hill, um, quote, in which an ad blocking extensions are labeled as a, quote, risk factor to Google's revenues. New and existing technologies could affect our ability to customize ads and or could block ads online, which could harm our business. Pause. Google is an ad business. Their main income comes from advertisement, tracking people, and building a global surveillance state. That is what Google is. Google is not a search engine anymore, primarily. It is not a maps thing, primarily. It's not a voice recognition thing, primarily. Google is a tracking company. Since they bought DoubleClick, they have become this thing that makes its income. Uh, up until they really bought DoubleClick, they, they were looking around for something to make money with. They had all these cool projects, all this cool technology, a lot of it free and open source, but there was no money coming, very little money coming in. And so DoubleClick gave them that thing that is going to keep Google alive for a long time, which is the income from compromising its users' privacy in every way it possibly can or something close to it. And so ad blockers, we, we, I, I think some people think that when they see ads, it's you looking at the ad, but that's only something minor. You looking at the ad, whether or not you, you're conscious of it, whether or not you're, the ad is working its way into your subconscious, because even if you can't see it, it's still affecting you. Regardless of all that, most of the work of the ad is going the other way around. The ad contains code that is going to try to pull information about you back to Google. It is only the visual representation of a, an infection in your system of software that is allowing Google to 
learn about you. Now, what are they going to learn? Maybe it's who you are. Maybe it's your name, your your uh, demographic group. Uh, maybe it's going to be what you're focusing on at the time, how many tabs you have open, what kind of web browser you use, what kind of computer you use, how rich you are, where in the world you are. Maybe if you're gay or straight, maybe if you're a male or, or man or a woman, all kinds of things that then other people can then use to take advantage of you or to harm you. And that is exactly why they are taking it. It's because people, companies, find it valuable to take advantage of their customers. Uh, so they will get information from Google about their customers so that they can further take advantage of them. The whole system is set up to be uh, perverse and ex or exploitative, and it's set up with Google as the central point of knowledge of so many things. And every time you see an ad on a computer, uh, and probably TV. It wouldn't surprise me if they've worked their way into TV ads. But an ad basically on any digital system, you can bet that Google or something like Google is behind it. And so block, technology that allows you to block ads is actually protecting you from active harm by companies like Google. So it's not surprising that Google would take steps given they control the platform, they control the code and the development team that runs and, and maintains that code for the web browser for most people in the world, that they are going to frustrate attempts by most people in the world to have their information about them pulled without their necessarily, without their consent into Google. It, it makes sense at a totally selfish level for Google to do this, but it's, oh, I lost the internet. Am I still online? Yes, yes I am. Interesting. Uh, so it makes sense that they did it, but they still did it. And it's a, I think it's a wrong thing for them to have done. And if you are still using Google Chrome and you have the option of switching, now would be the time. Brave is one browser that's based on Google Chrome's code base, but doesn't have Google as their developer. Now, I don't know all that much about Brave other than that. It may be worth investigating Brave to see if you can switch everything, all your bookmarks, all whatever it is you use Chrome for to that. Chromebooks, can you can install uh, Chromium OS on them. You can possibly even install other things on them. It's worth playing around with. I haven't got this one to the point where I can do that yet. Might do that soon, but there's that. If you have the ability to use Firefox, there's it, it's probably better to use Firefox than Chrome, even though both Firefox and Chrome support EME DRM and so, you, though you can disable it in Firefox, I don't know, and oh yeah, I, I guess the last time I checked, you can disable it in Chrome. There is by default uh, DRM in both. So it's worth going through and finding the option to disable EME uh, and doing so. If you are, if you have the option though, you can also use the Tor browser. The Tor browser is probably the best thing you can switch away from Chrome for uh, that is available right now. But again, it's, it's not everyone's going to be able to change the browser that they use schools, libraries, all kinds of things where the, the computer is under control of someone else, the people who use those computers are going to start seeing more ads and they're going to start having their information pulled by those ads to allow the companies like Google to track them and to build a tighter net to bind us, to keep us from being able to resist them, from keeping us from being able to organize against them. And so the time to start acting on that is now or maybe yesterday. But again, switch away from Chrome if you can. If you can't switch away from Chrome, start doing some investigation to see why. And if you can start to make that move, uh, maybe by replacing things like Chromebooks with something like uh, uh, Prism machines, uh, there's that to consider. So uh, another thing that's going on, uh, this is from three weeks ago. Uh, Laura Loomer, uh, quote, Twitter claims pro-life content is, quote, inflammatory, which it is. Come on, guys, let's be honest. It's inflammatory material. All bioethics stuff is inflammatory. You're not going to get away from that. Uh, continuing on, quote, bans pro-life ads. And so long story short, Twitter has removed some, and you can probably imagine exactly what kind of ads they are. They're probably the same kind of ads on Twitter that the pro-lifers posted as posters back when posters were kind of the dominant method of 
advertising things. Now, it's interesting, though, that, that we have these two stories back to back, right? Because people should be able to, to block ads. And in particular, these ads are going to produce demographics and, and, and get information from the people who view them to Twitter. Maybe a little bit of that information is going to trickle down to the people who did the ad campaigns. But certainly Twitter is going to, using these ads, actively harm its users and other people who randomly stumble upon their website. But at the same time, oh, yeah, and, and it's a commercial thing, right? So they're paying for this. Twitter as a business is accepting money for this. And so there, there is a matter of this is a market transaction, not a speech act in many senses. So it's worth considering whether as a market participant, Twitter should or shouldn't be held accountable for not allowing this particular kind of message to go through. But it's not entirely a market transaction. There is part of this that is a speech act and part of it, which is just speech generally. And so let's see in this article, quote, Twitter's CEO Jack Dorsey has repeatedly told the news media that Twitter doesn't ban content based on its users' viewpoints. Earlier this month at the House Energy and Commerce Committee hearing, members of Congress tested him on the assertion several times whether Twitter engaged in suppressing more conservative voices. Each time Dorsey replied no. Even his written statement to the committee, he said the purpose of Twitter is to serve the public conversation and we do not make ju value judgments on personal beliefs. Yet for years, Twitter has blocked one of the most prominent pro-life organizations online from advertising our pro-life message on the platform. So I can tell from experience that Jack Dorsey's statements are not the truth. They talk a little bit about how this isn't surprising that conservatives who are being silenced because it's just another way that conservatives can get the short end of the stick. That's, that's probably the, the meat of this one. And that was again from Laura Loomer's website. Uh, and so th this is a little bit of an interesting one because of the factors that I mentioned. But still, if they're going to allow or talk about allowing any kind of political content, and then they actually go and remove some political content, and this is political content, whether you agree or disagree, they have claimed to be neutral on this sort of thing, and they've been caught with their pants down not being neutral. And so the, on one hand, what else are they not telling the truth about? On the other, it's worth at least investigating their their arguments, their rhetoric, their, their websites, whatever it was that uh, we are being prevented from being advertised to by this kind of censorship, but probably not by much, because again, this is an ad. We, we don't want to see ads generally. And so there, there's, there's a lot of mitigating factors here, but it's worth knowing about, so, because is it going to stop there? Is it going to stop at this particular voice being silenced on Twitter in the ways that where Twitter is meant to be used. Again, we're, worth keeping an eye on. And so anyway, um, oh yeah. So the, the last thing I kind of want to get into, there's no link for this. So this is, this is just gonna be kind of off the top of my head. But before I left Thunder Bay, we, I went out to dim sum with a, a couple of people. And one of the people I went out to dim sum with was telling me that the new first aid, they're really not giving out books anymore, or, or at least it's not as important to have the first aid book which I used to have a copy of. I don't know where my copy went. I think it walked away with one of my exes. I think, I'm not really sure, but, um, but it used to be a thing where if you, every five or four or whatever years, you have to retake your first aid course just to stay current to remember what you have to do in the case of a crisis to know the current numbers uh, so that, you, you know, how many compressions versus how many breaths, that sort of thing, which does change over the long haul. And it's worth getting retrained every once in a while. And so as part of that, they give you a book, or basically you buy a book uh, that has all the instructions that you really need to, to do effective emergency first aid or standard first aid. Um, and so the rumor is, though, at least, and I haven't been able to confirm this because I haven't gone for my, my, uh, my course yet because my CPR first aid has expired. I'm going to have to very soon, but the rumor is, is that the new way of doing it is with an app, a proprietary uh, program where you don't have to know anything, really. You just have to plug into the program what's wrong, and the program tells you what to do. And this is the model where the Red Cross is going, because everyone has phones, and no one wants to learn anything or think for themselves. So they're going to remove the thinking part from the equation 
and just make everything kind of like the AEDs have been for quite some time, where you just follow the instructions, you tell the computer what's wrong, you tell the computer what to do, and the computer tells you what to do from there. And I find this to be dangerous. Again, I haven't seen all the details yet, so it's maybe it's, it's not that bad. Maybe they, maybe they did release the source code, who knows? But from what I can tell, they haven't. It's a piece of code that everyone's gonna have to install in order to have a decent job, because after all, you're gonna need to have first aid to have that job. And if a requirement of having first aid is to have a phone and to install spyware on that phone for the government to keep track of you, <laughs> like how far are we gonna go on this, right? Are we there yet? Is, is this where we're at? Again, I haven't, I haven't seen the program for myself. I, I haven't been able to verify that, but it sure sounds like we're there. And that is the next step where we're gonna be required by not necessarily law, but by social, social convention that every important business and every major government branch requires this course. And if that course requires us to use software that's proprietary, that's how they're gonna squeak it into our lives. And Richard Stallman has made the point over and over that once you allow proprietary software into your life, that software grows and it grows and it grows. And like a cancer, gradually takes over all of the functions of your operating system. Adobe Acrobat is a great example of this. Adobe is a PDF viewer. It's a, or Adobe, uh, Acrobat is a PDF viewer. It's just something to display a document on your screen. And sure, PDFs as the format isn't super simple, but like the, the program I use, let's see how big it is here. Uh, 2.6K. Okay, so it's a script that runs. Okay, there we go. So 229 kilobytes, which is like, <laughs> you can sneeze, right, in a video like this, and the video length is 200 kilobytes long. Like, it's tiny. It's nothing. You don't really need anything more than that to do PDF. I'm sure Edense is a little bit bigger, but uh, it's, it's just... Yes, the original or the Adobe Acrobat probably has a couple of features that make it, make it a little bit bigger than that, but it doesn't need to be as big as it is. And the reason why it's as big as it is is because hidden in the program is a bunch of support for other things like CAD drawings and possibly multimedia, uh, flash-like functionality, um, all kinds of things that the user basically never needs or never knows about until they buy other Adobe products. And then because Adobe Acrobat is installed on everything, the other products don't have to install as much because their dependencies are already there. And so you can imagine that other proprietary software developers, th this isn't just Adobe who's doing this, right? Uh, ja Oracle Java probably does the same thing. Uh, Microsoft, guaranteed, does the same thing with all of its updates. And there's all kinds of functionality that is going to be in the software that you don't know what it does, and it's going to be there. And unless you only use free software, it, you can count on it being there. And so, uh, again, it's 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 not just the app. It's not just the fact that that app can be used to to compromise your system. It's what else are they going to put in that app in the future? Maybe they're not putting out anything else in there now. But you can bet that if it's made mandatory, that's going to be a really juicy target, just like Adobe Acrobat was, for the Red Cross to be told or given or, or some way convinced to include other functionality, and then that functionality will grow, and so on and so forth. So what's what's the way forward on this one? Uh, one way of going about it is to just not take the Red Cross training and to find work that doesn't need it, or, or to fake it. You can probably fake it. That's one, one way of doing things. But it, it may be worth having some people go through the training and complain and to contact the Red Cross and to say, hey, look, this is going to cause people to die. The not having people with first aid training is going to cost lives. Like, for sure, this is going to be a measurable amount of human life lost because of what they are going to be, what they are doing right now by requiring this spyware, this malware, this this adware perhaps to be included by default in everyone's operating environment. Now, is it going to be adware? Is it going to be spyware immediately? Maybe it's not, but again, proprietary software, you should always assume the worst until you can prove otherwise to a limit of two to the 
nth power where n is the number of bits you're, you're talking. Like there, there's only so much functionality you can put per bit. So uh, there's, there, there is that to consider. But it, again, it's just, we can't let it happen here. The, the Red Cross, they, there's too much goodwill that they have where the, everyone kind of assumes that they're doing the right thing. Kind of like Duck, Ducks Unlimited. Like what's wrong with Ducks Unlimited? That they, they help ducks, right? That, that sounds like a happy, great thing to do until you realize that they're giving money that they collect from donations of people who want to help ducks and wildlife and wetlands to the SAS party, right? So unless you know this, you're probably going to just assume that the Red Cross is a good thing, right? The Red Cross helps soldiers when they're being tortured or, or political prisoners when they're being tortured, you know? So really, they have all this goodwill to burn on them. But the, and people are, are going to just assume that they're, they're always going to make the right choice. But in this case, they're probably not making the right choice. Again, I don't have all the data, but, you know, go find out, go do the research, go find it out for yourself. But it sure looks like they're fucking this one up. So go find out and uh, get back to me on this because I want to know a little bit more and I guess continue from there. But anyway, long story short, this is about as long as I want it to go on. So uh, if you enjoyed this, uh, feel free to support me on Subscriber Star or Villages or possibly Bitcoin or whatever. And the video will be posted later. If you have any questions or comments you want me or anything you want me to talk about, send it to me by email or instant message or ricochet or whatever. And... If you'd like your song or some Creative Commons song to be played on the show, send it to me. I will give it a listen. And with that, I'll see you next week in my new apartment. See you then.